Thank you for tuning in today. I'm Tyler Smith with Something in the Wild, um, Something in the Wild podcast. Yeah, I appreciate you guys uh, tuning in today. I'm gonna got a couple different topics that I want to talk talk about. Um, I want to talk about my week in review first. I'm gonna talk about some conservation news, and then I'm also gonna talk about this week's outdoor activities, stuff that you can kind of get outside and do this week, um, and kind of instruct you on on how to go about doing that. So, without further ado, let's get it started. My week in review. So this past weekend, Sammy and I loaded up the camper as we usually do on a long weekend. Um, it was Labor Day, so we had a great time heading up to New York State. So we were in upstate New York, um, near Agnola, New York. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys know if uh, where that's at or anything. Um, nice, small little town on the coast of Lake Erie. And it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, very quiet, peaceful town. Um, like I said, right on the water, we were able to do some really fun, cool things. Um, the first thing that we ended up doing was the first notable thing I guess we kind of went to the beach the first day and and we hung out there hung out around camp and and just kind of relaxed um that first Saturday morning and you know into Saturday afternoon um we went on a hike but um I'll get into that here in a minute but first thing we first notable thing we did was we went to Niagara Falls um about an hour and a half away from where we were where we were staying and man it's like I, I've been there once before, and it's it's really amazing, um, you know, just how big the falls are, how much water is flowing um, over top of the falls. And a little fun fact about Niagara Falls: so anyone that's familiar with the biology of the Great Lakes, um, they have this invasive species, this invasive pest. It's the um, oh crap, it's the <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm, I'm gonna forget it right now. Just a just a quick brain fart. Um, it's the the snake looking thing, um, the lamprey, the lamprey. Um, so Lake Erie has this infestation of lamprey that that feed on the bigger predatory fish species. Um, you know, walleye, musky, steelhead. A lot of the time are susceptible to. Um, you know, to these lamprey and Niagara Falls for the longest time was the barrier. Um, it was the barrier from lamprey spreading to the rest of the Great Lakes. And they eventually made a lock system around Niagara Falls and that inevitably spread the lamprey to the rest of the Great Lakes, which is kind of unfortunate because they do wreak havoc. But, um, you know, it kind of had to be done. Uh, a lot of shipping goes through the Great Lakes, and to be able to ship from basically the bay, um, the East Coast Bay, into the Great Lakes, I mean, it act, so much access for, for shipping and stuff like that. So it made sense, but uh, kind of an unfortunate consequence. Um, another thing that we did on our trip, we went to, to Zora or Zoar Valley. I'm going to call it Zoar Valley, and we went on a hike there. Now, this place, apparently, very, very dangerous. So whenever we first got there, there were a bunch of warning signs, bunch of things, bunch of placards that said, hey, stay 15 feet at least away from the cliff. And I was like, holy crap. I mean, this is, this is kind of crazy. It was like every, like, 15 feet or 15, 20, 30 feet, there was a sign saying, you should not get any closer to the tr- to the edge of the um, edge of the rim. Um, and and basically what it was, it was a giant gorge, um, and it's apparently very very dangerous according to a lot of the news that I was that I was reading about. Um, pretty much good for one death every single year. Someone dies every single year at that park. Um, which is which is really crazy. It's it's very unfortunate, um, but it is a really really beautiful area. Uh, there's a nice river that flows through the bottom, and um, and you can kind of hike on the ridge tops and 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 see out over the over the gorge, and it and it's really beautiful. Um, really awesome area. Now, that area, you know, kind of the general area that we are around, it was the Seneca Nation of Indians land. So, the Seneca tribe 
is basically there, there's there were six tribes in that area. Um, I believe it was the Iroquois Confederacy, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong there, but essentially they are now called the Seneca Nation of Indians, um, and they have a big cultural center, a big building. And I was reading up on their culture, you know what um what what it kind of entails and things like that. And they're a true democ- democracy. So. You know, unlike America, where you have elected officials that then make decisions, um, you, uh, with the Seneca Nation of Indians, they they vote on everything. So it's a true democracy. They are voting um, for all sorts of decisions being made, um, and I think that's very very cool. Um, it, it was awesome. I was I was hoping to be able to connect with someone there to to kind of talk with them, have them on the podcast, just kind of explain you know, their culture and things like that. Wasn't able to make that happen. Um, but I do really like it up there. <clears throat> I, I hope to go back at some point. So if anyone from the Seneca Nation of Indians is watching, be sure to reach out. I would love to have you on the podcast, um, you know, make a video about your land and and kind of dive a little bit deeper into it. I think people want to know, at least me personally, I really want to know, uh, you know, more about your culture, what you guys do. So please reach out. Um, another great thing about that, um, that area, very, very cheap gas. Uh, I stopped at a bunch of gas stations on the reservation and it was like 60, 70 cents cheaper than any other local gas station, which was so, so nice, especially whenever you're toting around that big camper, you don't get the best gas mileage in the world. So being able to stop there, cheap gas, very, very cool. And the last thing that we did um, whenever we were up in New York, uh, we went a couple different times, but we went to the coast of Lake Erie. So took the dogs there. Um, Cole was playing fetch in the water. It was their first time at the beach. So Bean was a little bit nervous of the water at first, but he eventually got used to it. And then Koa was just, it was like he was born to be there. And the last night that we were there, uh, Sunday night, we were gifted with the most beautiful sunset I have seen in a long time. It was just all sorts of shades of orange and yellow, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was just such a perfect night, and really, really made me want to come back and you know come back to that place, um, come back to that place again. It was just so much freaking fun, so much fun. Um, so yeah, that was our trip. That was our week in review. Now. Let's head on to some conservation news. So there's a there's three different things I want to talk about. I want to talk about Utah's um, land grab scheme with uh, with some federal land, some PA trout stream designations, and then also some wildlife restoration, habitat restoration type things that um, the United States is doing that is very very good for wildlife and for habitat. So first up, Utah. Utah is right now attempting to acquire BLM land, which is stands for the Bureau of Land Management. Um, they're trying to buy it from the federal government. Basically, their argument is that the federal government shouldn't be maintaining land in the state of Utah. The state of Utah should be maintaining that land. Well, I got news for you, Utah. You don't have a very good track record of taking care of public land and keeping it in public hands. Um, And that's their saying that they're going by, which they're basically copying um, the backcountry hunters and anglers saying, keep public lands in public hands. That means to keep it public, keep it owned by the government or by the federal government or by the state government or whatever. Well, Utah is turning that around and saying that to keep public lands in public hands is to then sell it to the public so that only rich people can afford it and the you know everyday american can't access it which does not make any sense there it's huge huge money grab scheme um and utah's resume is not good for taking care of their public land so they've already sold over three and a half million of its seven and a half million acres of state land so they've sold more than 50 percent of their state land thus far um and that is really terrible utah was one of the states in the country and they still are they have 
one of the mo the the highest percentage of public land in the country but this is a very slippery slope that that utah is treading on right now um looking to acquire federal land from the government to then sell it which presumably is what's going to happen um they haven't specified that specifically they're saying that oh we want we want the federal land to be under state jurisdiction so that we can then manage it eh, i don't know if that's going to happen exactly because once they get a hold of it they can sell it they can pawn it off they can auction it off to the highest bidder and then no one gets to see it again so not good on you utah not good now the next thing i want to talk about two things more on a more positive end so in pa the home state my home state Pennsylvania, we got 45 new trout streams looking to get redesignated as Class A and Wild Trout Waters. So those are two different designations. There's Class A, there's Wild Trout Waters. Wild Trout Water is essentially no stocking, all organically grown, if you want to refer to it like that, organically grown trout from, from egg to adulthood. They're completely wild, a cold stream, uh, cold limestone, limestone stream, usually uh, spring fed. And um, that's the highest designation that a trout water can receive. Oh, second highest, I guess. The highest would be Class A, which is the other designation that these streams are looking to acquire. So Class A is can be stocked sometimes, but also can be wild. But... The big differentiator between Class A and wild trout is the fact that Class A can hold significantly larger fish. Um, class A basically means that it holds both abundant and large fish, abundant populations and large fish. So getting that Class A designation is huge. Now, there's a lot of people arguing that, hey, this probably shouldn't ignore the dog scratching on the door. This probably shouldn't happen because... They've gotten to this point because they've been successful in their management. Well, I disagree. I think that the higher the designation, the more money that these that these streams can be granted for funding to clean them out even more, to protect the areas around them. I don't think it's going to limit access. I don't think it's going to limit recreational opportunity. I think it's all good things coming from Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, trying to redesignate these 49 streams. Last thing that we got in the conservation news. So states across the West are now looking to add wildlife bridges to connect travel corridors for migrating species such as elk, mule deer, um, moose, um, sh you know, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, things like that. Um, now there's already a couple states in the West, just to name a few, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, even is is adding these these wildlife bridges. Basically, you know, think about a car bridge, except instead of a road going over top of another road, it's just dirt and plants going over top of the road. And they and they have funnels where there's fencing on the sides of the highways that funnels movement either over these bridges or through tunnels to connect the um divided habitat that these that these animals have to face now you know with the with the upbringing of the interstate system and just the amount of travel that's done via car a lot of these a lot of these environments a lot of um you know these native ranges of these these animals are being fragmented and to be able to connect them is huge for their success and it, it, it might even bolster the population it might increase the population because they have um they're able to access these these areas that you know they used to have to be in harm's way to access they'd have to they'd have to cross highways and i'm sure everyone has seen dead deer on the highway before dead dead elk or you know even dead bears and things like that so being able to connect these habitats great step in the conservation direction making sure that we're taking care of our animals and in those species um and just to kind of add on to that 12 states have issued executive orders to preserve these travel corridors so there's 12 different states across the west and even on the east coast too there's a couple on the east coast 
um, that have issued these executive orders. So good stuff coming from the conservation news department. Now, lastly, I want to talk about some things that you can do outside this week. So as you guys know, it's September. September means elk rutting. And this is the best time of year to be in the elk woods. Um, now, I know not a lot of people are in the elk woods. I do not live in like near the elk woods, really. I mean, 29 of 50 states do have elk. Pennsylvania is included in that 29 states, but it is kind of far away. I mean, the closest elk kind of range is in north central Pennsylvania. It's probably like a good three, three and a half hours away from me. But the elk rut is just a magical, magical time. Um, you go out there, you get to enjoy the bu the bulls bugling, just screaming their heads off, chasing cows. It is a really, really magical experience. And I just, I would hate for anyone to not experience it. So if you are interested in elk, you in, you're interested in wild animals like seeing wild animals do wild animal things there's nothing more wild and crazier than a bull elk bugling i'm going to tell you that right now so um like i said there's 29 out of 50 states hold elk um, a lot of those states that don't are in the the great plains or in the northeast but with the great plains you're kind of near some states that do have elk so there, there's an opportunity for you to go make a little bit of a road trip but for those um those folks there in the northeast you're kind of sol unless you plan on traveling a pretty long distance um but i don't feel too too bad you guys have moose and you guys have great lobster and saltwater and trout fishing so you know i'm not going to feel too bad for you um but that's it for my week and the conservation news and um this week in the outdoors i really appreciate you guys tuning in i hope you guys liked this format of episode and be sure to check out the YouTube channel. We got videos coming out all the time, every week. So um, take a look at that. Take a look at our website. Uh, that is somethinginthewild.com. Um, take a look at the rest of our podcast episodes, the rest of our long-form videos. We got some gear review videos. So be sure to check that out and make sure everyone to keep it wild.